Oh, hey, what up? What up? What up? What are you doing? Oh, I'm going to take out this 400 and then put in a 200, just like the one above it. We're what? just replacing a feeder. Um, right on. So I'm just taking a picture. And What's the AIC on that thing? Oh, I have no idea. I mean, what do you mean? The, the, uh, the rating on the breaker? Oh, well, I'm just going to take a picture of the one that's there and then just order the same thing. It's pretty simple. What up Sparky, it's your boy Evan here and this video is available fault current labeling number three. Now you may have seen the first two videos where we went over the requirements and the safety aspects of it. And this video is gonna be the practical application of that information and really it's, it's reality. And what do I mean by that? Aside from the people that teach this stuff or maybe the engineers that design electrical systems every day, um, when it comes to the actual boots on the ground, the people that install this, order it, do the estimating on it, job walks, um, and sometimes even all the way over to the inspectors, there's a major deficiency in understanding this topic. And what that can result in are some unsafe electrical installations, um, or best, some wasted money. And we don't want either one of those, right? So if you're an apprentice, um, or if, you're, if you have a lot of experience, I wanna invite you to watch this video. And at the end of it, um, if it kind of went over your head, then at least take away one thing. And it's gonna be that when you're looking at overcurrent devices or controllers or their enclosures, you're gonna notice uh, current ratings or whether it's available interrupting current or short circuit current ratings. I want you to pay attention to those numbers and just let them start to pop out at you. And eventually you'll start to ask questions and you'll start to get your own answers. And hopefully by then you'll be uh, somebody that is making safe installations and part of the solution instead of potentially part of the problem. All right, so before I bust up this guy's process here, I wanna talk about three acronyms that are gonna always come up when we're talking about this topic. And the first one is AFC, which is Available Fault Current. That's the actual energy that's available and will be coming at the line side of the equipment or an overcurrent device. Then you have the SCCR, which is short circuit current rating. That applies to the equipment and the busing in it. Then you have the AIC, which is available interrupting current, which applies to the breaker or the fuse or the overcurrent device itself. Now the thing is, is when you add that breaker, that overcurrent device into an enclosure um, that has an SCCR, you actually can modify the SCCR of the enclosure called its full rating. In other words, here's an example. Let's say you had a, an enclosure with busing and it was rated at 100,000 amps. And then you take a breaker or, or some fuses that are at 65,000 amps, it would really be probably a breaker. Put that in there, you're gonna reduce the rating, the full rating of that enclosure, the SCCR, now will go down to 65,000 amps, which is uh, basically the weakest link. So in other words, if you send more available fault current to that enclosure, then the weakest link, then that will fail. And that's the point. Um, so these three things are gonna come up all the time on this topic. The other thing that's involved, which it's a deep topic I'm not gonna go into, but it's called series rating. And really what that is, is it allows you to send, potentially send more fault current um, than an overcurrent device can actually handle. The reason why it allows you to do that is because you have a, an overcurrent device upstream that can handle the current. And the, the process there is that some of that current will make it to the downstream breaker that's not rated, but before it blows up, uh, the upstream breaker will shut off. So it's kind of like they handle the load or the overcurrent together, but the, uh, but the upstream one will shut off. Now, that's only typical in lighting panels, and you don't want to use it where these things are critical or you need selective coordination where, like the reason why you wouldn't want to use that in something critical would be like, you don't want to go into a hospital, trip a, uh, you know, a plug circuit and then shut down the dang hospital because it was series rated all the way up to the main. That would be bad. Um, but if it's just like lighting in a warehouse or something, you would use series rated, maybe save some money on that stuff. Uh, aside from that though, we're gonna just focus on fully rated and that's just the easiest way to talk about this topic. So let's go back and uh, see what's going on there. This switchboard doesn't have the actual available fault current that's coming into the property on the equipment, which is required. Um, there's a lot of places in California that they just don't have this labeling. However, a lot more new construction and new buildings are putting in this on there. They're finally starting to catch it. But I mean, you're talking about 
40, 50, 60 plus years of big equipment like this with nothing on it. So in this circumstance, uh, just to verify what the breaker requirement is here, we can get an idea um, by taking a look outside. Let's check that out. So I came out here to the utility transformer for this building and um, it looks fairly new and I happen to know they did just replace it and I know they actually upsized it which brings some other things into question in that is the existing switch gear uh, rated for this new transformer. It does matter. This kind of thing is rare where they will upgrade the transformer um, with the same existing service. Uh, it can actually let through more power and damage equipment or be beyond the rating of the equipment if, they're short, if a short circuit did happen, something of that nature. But um, just for the sake of working on a breaker here, I can take a look at the label here and it'll tell us the KVA, the impedance. It even says the line side voltage on it, which is pretty cool. So uh, we can assume infinite power at the source or just ahead of this transformer and we'll know the maximum amount of energy that could be squeezed through this thing. Hi there, I'm going to show you the formula so I'm going to have my friend Charlotte show us the simple formula for figuring out the maximum available fault current or the maximum let through. You can use that to make sure that the breaker you're replacing um, is going to be a higher rating or add to or a higher rating than the maximum possible fault current that could hit that equipment. Now as soon as I talk, start talking about formulas, some of you, I'm just going to lose you. Now, I'm no expert. Well, hopefully Charlotte helps keep our attention a little bit. Well, that's the point, really. Um, and then some of you are going to say, like, I, I don't need to know that formula. I've been doing this for a long time. I never needed to know it. And that might be true for some of you. Or you work in the residential sector where everything is going to be rated uh, properly for these plug-ons, like 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, so you're just going to go to Home Depot or Lowe's and whatever they have is pretty much going to work. You won't need to worry about this. Um, but for the rest of you, I would, uh, I would challenge that and say, you know, I, actually I would just ask you, you know, how important is grounding and bonding? You know, and most of you are going to have to agree that that's a really important part of our job, right? So then the next question would be, well, what is it that you're grounding and bonding? And then this is where we start to separate people between the knowledge that they have and the theory that they understand. and, and uh, that type of thing and you know a lot of you would say well that's the the fault current there right you say well how many amps is that and this is where we really start to separate people so engineers people that teach this stuff um, people that have had to figure this out before understand that the available fault current that you're actually grounding is a lot like typically in the thousands um, however a lot of us that are in the field we don't really deal with that that much you know and that's what I want to dispel or that's what I want to like educate on real quick and here's a great example now when I was first learning the trade and I was, you know, looking at some number, uh, you know, I was looking at a hundred amp circuit with like a number six ground wire on it. And like, why is that ground wire so small? And then I asked the journeyman, Hey man, why is this thing so small? And they said, well, you know, that ground wires, it's a backup. It's an emergency. It's in case something goes wrong, it can carry the current back and help trip the breaker. Right? So that made sense to me. And then, you know, as you get into it, you start to realize, okay, as far as the rest of the conductors, there's a table that will tell you the impacity. You have some things to factor in, but ultimately a table will tell you the impacity for the circuit conductors. You know, and let's say like a number six, you look it up and that's good for 50 amps. Well, if you go to that 122 or equipment grounding conductors, that number six is only going to be good for, oh, well, it's going to be good for 100 amps, right, for a ground. So then you go, well, what the heck, how come I can only put... Uh, you know, 50 amps on it for a circuit, and I can put 100 amps on it for a ground. You go, oh, okay, I get it. It's a backup, right? So then you rationalize and you say, well, it kind of makes sense. I can put 50 amps on it indefinitely for what it's worth, um, and then I can put 100 amps on it for a short period of time, and that makes sense. And a lot of us will rationalize that. I mean, take like a car, a sedan or something like that, like a five-seater car, right? You can, it's designed for five people, and as long as there's enough snacks and potty breaks, you can go for a long time with five people and be reasonably comfortable. It's designed for that. Um, now, what if you had to fit 10 people in that sedan, right? Twice as many? Um, first, you would say, oh, no, you can't do that. And then you go, okay, well, I guess you could lap some people. You could cram some people in there. It wouldn't be legal. You could sit somebody on top of the car, on the trunk hood, whatever. Um, now, how far could you go? Well, you couldn't go very far, and it wouldn't be comfortable, right? 
but it would drive and, and it would go. So there are a lot of things in life that would parallel that. And because that makes sense, you look back at those conductors and the amperages, not to mention, I mean, for a circuit conductor, you're looking at a table and it has an amperage and a wire gauge. And then you go to the grounding chart and it has an amperage and a wire gauge. So, I mean, that makes sense. The problem is, is that when you're looking at, you know, a number six is good for a hundred amp circuit, um, 100 amps is not what it's good for. It's actually going to be able to carry a lot more of that to the tune of thousands potentially. Um, and that is what is not widely understood. People are thinking, well, a number six can ground a 100 amp circuit. It's like, well, yeah, it can ground, act as the effective path for a 100 amp circuit, but really the current that will travel through it can be in the thousands, right? So you need to not look at 122 as if it was an ampacity chart. It's more of like a range, right? And that you need to know that the amperages on 122 that will actually represent current that could travel on those conductors is a lot higher, right? Now, what is that current? How do you figure that out? That's what this formula is for, and it's really simple. And Charlotte's gonna show us how. This will help you select breakers. Check it out. Hi there. I'm going to show you the formula for this transformers for maximum available fault current or the maximum let through. Now, I'm no expert, but that's the point really. It's actually very simple. For the three phase formula, we need three numbers. The first is total VA, which in this case is 750,000. The second number is our secondary voltage, adjusted for three phase, which we will use 831. And the third number is a transformer's impedance, which in this case it's 5.7% written as 0 0.057. So the formula will look like this. 750,000 VA divided by 831 divided by 0 0.057, which will give us our conservative maximum available fault current on the secondary side, which is 15,833 amps. Now that was painless. And it truly is a simple formula, and you can use this on, you know, the transformers that we deal with day to day. Um, however, there are a couple of small adjustments, and I would leave it out, but I think it's important to note because some people are going to chime right in and say, well, what about motor contribution? And motor, motor contribution is a factor, but just talking about reality here, if you, unless you're in a factory or somewhere where there are a lot of big motors, like coca-cola factory or just something major like that it's not really going to be a factor um, best practices on that are three to five times locked rotor amps and you would add that and that's if the motor is running um, if it's not even running then it's not a factor so those things it, it, it can make it hard to get an accurate um, you know maximum let through if you have a solar system and there's a short and the sun is up it's going to be able to produce additional fault current to your fault point um, so that's something else that will have to be factored in so that information uh, is almost you know in my experience it's like 95 percent always available so that one's an easy grab um, but yeah i would say that uh, that when this is a factor it's kind of easy to calculate but those are the two things motor contribution and solar contribution if you will Again, this tool for you of just figuring out what the maximum let through of a transformer is, is so that you know that, hey, the maximum possible uh, that I could need for this breaker is 40,000 amps or 16,000 amps. In other words, if the transformer was a 16,000 amp transformer, you don't need a 40,000 amp breaker there, right? That's, that's really what we can use this for from a practical level in the field. So I don't want you to be intimidated and I don't want you to get confused with motor contribution or what a solar system added, you know, could do. Um, I just want you to focus on the fact that it's a simple formula. You can look at any transformer and you can figure out what the maximum let through is. Um, it can come in real handy if you're dealing with like a small, like you look and you got a 50 kVA transformer. Well, the let through is going to be maybe a couple thousand amps on that. So you don't need anything higher than a 10,000 amp breaker. You know, and, and that's really what I want you guys to, to get out of this. And I don't want you to be intimidated because people will look at this formula and say, oh, that's for engineers. That's an engineering thing. But it's like you as the electrician can use this information and do something practical with it. That's the point. 
So the last note is, is that if you want to calculate the actual available fault current, um, you can do that too with the same formula, um, the additional information. So we've already went over transformer maximum let through. We talked about uh, motor contribution, solar contribution. The last piece um, that's going to begin to matter is the conductors or the, the conductors between points, right? Those are going to add plenty of resistance that will also reduce the available fault current as you get farther away from the source. Um, or if there are intermediate transformers that will also reduce it. But before you even start messing with that, if you're gonna try to get that level of detail, um, which is more than just you know what a typical electrician would need to replace a breaker or just make sure that he's uh, being responsible with breaker replacement, um, you would need to start with the utility company's uh, available fault current because they're the ones that are bringing it to your site. And that's the starting point. And it's not gonna be an infinite source at that point. It's gonna be you know, 70,000 amps or 30,000 amps, and that's your starting point. And then you begin to chip away at that current with resistance, and then you add to it with your contributions. Um, and that can all be done, and that will actually provide you with a legit engineering calculation that you can, you know, submit. If you have any questions on this topic, I mean, you can Google it. There's tons of information. Um, my buddy Ryan Jackson is going to be coming out with a video on this. Um, I'm sure he's going to go into plenty of depth on it as well. I think Mike Holt has some stuff. So uh, if you have any questions, you can hit me up or just, just Google it. It's out there. So I want to encourage you to continue learning about this topic. And thanks for watching.